2 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. Let's read here in verse 14. We'll read down through verse 17. Then we'll ask the Lord's blessing upon his word this morning. Let's read 2 Timothy 3.14. The Bible says, Paul writing to Timothy, But continue, thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that we have it. Thank you that we have it in our language. Thank you that we can read it, understand it, study it, and Lord, how easy it is to take it for granted. Lord, I pray that you would be with us here this morning as, as your word is read, as your word is preached. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us through your word. Lord, we live in a world where everything is upside down and uh, there's so much strife, there's so much grief, there's so much heartache, there's just so many things pulling at us, Lord. And I know even in just these last couple of weeks with just various things going on, vehicle issues and, and an issue with the trimmer and, and other things, Lord, it's, it's been a struggle. But Lord, we know that, that your word uh, was given to us for not just our salvation, but Lord, for our, uh, for our sanctification, for our growth, for our life. Lord, it's so important. It's so vital. And uh, Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, we thank you for our Savior. Lord, we thank you for yourself. Lord, we thank you just for all that you will do here in our midst. I pray that your spirit would just work in each heart that's here this morning. Whatever the need may be, Lord, you know each heart. You know each need. You know each one that's here. Bless our time together, Lord. We love you, and we need you. We ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, of course, uh, verses 16 and 17, you may have those memorized. Those seem to be a couple of verses that any type of, uh, any type of a Sunday school program, any type of a, of a kid's Bible club type program, 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16 and 17 are just two of those verses that we often memorize, and maybe you have them memorized, but... We're going to look at those verses a little bit today, but I started up in verse 14, and really, I want to look at verse 14 and verse 15. I want to share a couple things about this young man, Timothy. Of course, you know the context of this book. Paul is writing to Timothy. If you would take all of the epistles of Paul, and if you would put them in chronological order, or in other words, the order in which Paul actually wrote them, most would place this book as the final one that he wrote. This would be the final letter that he wrote, and he writes it to his young friend Timothy. And uh, he says some things here in this book about, well, for example, in chapter 4, we have the well-known verse again, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, and he, Paul talks about these things, and he's reminding Timothy of some things. And as we read this, you may ask the question, well, who exactly is Timothy? I mean, we know a lot about the Apostle Paul. Scripture is filled with a lot of information about Paul. We don't have as much uh, information necessarily about Timothy, but we do know some things. Uh, hold your place here in, in 2 Timothy 3. But I want to read a couple verses out of Acts 16. You can turn there if you'd like, or you can just uh, listen as I read Acts 16, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> We're given the first mention, if you will, of this young man named Timothy. The Bible says in Acts 16, verse 1, Then came he, speaking of Paul, to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, that's Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Back in 2 Timothy chapter 1, we find this in verse 5. Paul says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. The first thing we see about Timothy here is we see that Timothy had a godly mother who believed. Timothy had a godly grandmother who believed. 
You might say that Timothy <clears throat> grew up in a Christian home. I know it says his father was a Greek, it was his mother that believed, but yet Timothy, even from a child, even from a baby, really, we could say that Timothy had that godly influence in his life. Timothy, when I think of him as a young man, if we're, if we're speaking in our modern terminology, Timothy was a kid who, he was always there in Sunday school. He was always there at Vacation Bible School. Timothy was memorizing the Word of God when he was a young man, even just a child as growing up. Timothy would have had Bible class as part of his regular curriculum, whatever they did back then for schooling and all of those types of things. That's who Timothy was. Why? Because he had a godly mother. He had a godly grandmother. He had a wonderful heritage in his family <clears throat> that he had. Um, th he was able to take advantage of that by having those influences in his life. Maybe you're here this morning and you have a similar testimony. Maybe you have a, had a godly mother, a godly father, a godly grandmother, a godly grandfather. Maybe you have a tremendous spiritual heritage in your family. Personally, I have that, and I'm very thankful for that. My parents, my grandparents, many of my aunts and uncles, much if not most of my immediate family, and even extended family, uh, would know Christ as Savior. And folks, that's, that's a tremendous blessing. It really is. Not everyone can say that. I realize that. It's a blessing, and it would appear that Timothy would at least have some elements of that. But not only do we see some things about Timothy's family, we see some things about Timothy's faithfulness. I read back in Acts 16 how that he was well reported of by the brethren. Timothy had a good reputation. He had a good testimony. We see that in a couple other verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 Again, we'll come back to 2 Timothy 3, but if you want to turn, it's 1 Corinthians 4, 17. Paul writes to this church at Corinth, and he says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere, in every church. So here we have a situation where Paul he desires to go to this church and minister to this church, but he can't physically go at this time, so he's going to send Timothy in his stead. Why is he sending Timothy? Well, for one thing, he knows he can trust Timothy, because Timothy has proven himself to be faithful. Timothy has proven himself in the work of the Lord. Even though he's still just a young man, he's got a good testimony. Paul knows that he is someone that has a good report, that he's someone who he can trust. Another example of that we see in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 and verse 19, Paul now writing to another church, the church at Philippi. Now Paul wants to go to this church also at this time, but he can't because, as you probably know, when this epistle was written, Paul was in prison. And Roman prison was not such that you could just check out, go do whatever you needed to do, and then check back in when you were done. No, Paul was there in prison. He couldn't go. But look who he sends again in his stead. Uh, Philippians 2, 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ, but ye know the proof of him, speaking of Timothy, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Again, Paul saying really the same things here. Timothy, he's proven, he's faithful, he's like-minded. Paul knows he can trust him. Paul knows he can send him to do this work here in this church. Paul knows that Timothy's not going to show up there and do his own thing with his own agenda. But rather, Paul or Timothy has the same mind that Paul has, which in reality is the mind of Christ. So we, we see Timothy had a godly family, at least as far as his mother and his grandmother are concerned. Timothy was faithful. There was a great degree of faithfulness in his life. And yet... Uh, <clears throat> He also had a relationship with the Apostle Paul. Uh, in both of those passages, Paul makes mention of Timothy being a son, and many, if not most, would say that that would be an indication that Paul had a direct impact in the life of Timothy, not just as a mentor, not just as a discipler, perhaps, but that it was actually the Apostle Paul who led Timothy to Christ. 
Some would say that, and, and, and that is why they would say that Paul refers to Timothy as his son in the faith, because perhaps it was the Apostle Paul himself who had the privilege of leading a young man named Timothy who had grown up with a godly mother and a godly grandmother who had been praying for him. And, uh, and, and then Paul had the opportunity to lead this young boy to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and then mentored him and discipled him and helped him to grow, helped him to be faithful. But again, hold your, hold your, I keep saying hold your place in 2 Timothy. We will come back to those verses, I promise. But first, let's go to John chapter 1. I want to point something out here in John chapter 1. Based on everything that I, <clears throat> based on everything we've kind of gone over so far, it would seem that Timothy had a lot going for him. Timothy had a pretty good situation. Uh, he had a lot in his favor. Well-rounded young man and well thought of, well reported of, faithful. I mean, the Apostle Paul is, is in his corner, if you will, and giving him responsibilities and such. But... I want you to notice something in John chapter 1. This is interesting. What exactly was it? What, what is it really that made the ultimate difference in Timothy's life? A lot of influences, a lot of things that were in play here, but there's one thing that really made the ultimate difference in this young man's life. Look what John says in, uh, let's start in verse 10, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So the entire world didn't recognize him. Even his own, the nation of Israel, those who should have recognized him and received him, rejected him. But look at verse 12. It says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And then notice verse 13. The Bible says, Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You notice that phrase that says, which were born. If you go ahead a couple of pages, we won't turn there, but in John chapter 3, you have the account of Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And he makes a couple of statements. At one point he says, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A couple of verses later, he says, ye must be born again. So we have this idea of being born again. You couple that with this thought here in verse 13 of John 1, which says, which were born, and then there's three things mentioned. Which were born, not of blood. Well, what does that mean? Well, that just simply means that one is not simply born, naturally, a Christian. Timothy had a godly mother. That doesn't mean he was born a Christian. I have a godly mother who's a born-again believer. I have a godly father who is a born-again believer. They were both saved when they were young. So when they got married a long time ago, they uh, were two Christians coming together in marriage, and then they had a son. That's me. They did not produce a brand-new little born-again Christian. They produced a sinner. See, you're not born a Christian. It doesn't matter how godly your heritage is. As wonderful as it is to have a godly heritage, as wonderful as it is to have Christian parents, and there's a few young people here. Look, if you've got a mom and a dad that are born-again Christians, even if you have a mom or a dad that's a born-again Christian, thank the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. But that does not make you one. Because it's not of blood. It goes on to say, which were born not, nor of the will of the flesh. What does that mean? Well, that just simply means that in my flesh, I can't get there. I can't earn it. I can't, uh, I can't do my own thing to obtain salvation. You know, we looked at Timothy, and he had a good testimony. He was faithful, and, and we speculated a little bit that he, was, he had perfect attendance in Sunday school, and he memorized all the verses, and he won the awards, and, you know, had all the patches on his vest, or whatever you want to say, and, you know, that was young Timothy. He's doing all these wonderful things. Yet it's not of the will of the flesh. You don't earn it. It's not based on what we do. It's not based on our works. In fact, I believe the Bible tells us that in our flesh dwelleth no good thing. So we're not born of blood. We're not born of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. What does that mean? Well, very simply, no one can do it for you. 
Uh, oftentimes, you, you might put this in the context of the Catholic Church, where someone might think, well, if I go before the priest, and the priest will take care of things for me. The priest will, you know, make whatever things right that need to be made right. I'll just, I'll let somebody else handle it for me. You know, it doesn't work that way either. You can't go to another man to obtain salvation. You know, Timothy knew the Apostle Paul. Many would say the Apostle Paul was the greatest Christian that ever lived. Timothy knew him. Timothy was probably led to Christ by the Apostle Paul. He was discipled by the Apostle Paul. But you know what? One day when Timothy stands before the judgment seat of Christ, he's not going to say, well, you know, let, let's talk to Paul about me. No, because Timothy's there. He's standing there. No one's standing in his place before the Lord. Not the Apostle Paul, no one, he's there. And, and so very simply, born not of blood, so we're not born Christians, nor the will of the flesh, we can't make ourselves into Christians, nor of the will of man, there's no man on earth today that can cause us to be a Christian, that can in a sense do it for us, but of God, those last three words in John chapter 1, but of God. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Timothy had a lot going for him, but here is the ultimate thing he had going for him, and it's in verse 15, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. You know what Timothy had? He had a godly mother, he had a godly grandmother, he had a godly influence in the Apostle Paul, he had a lot of things going for him, but even more than all of that, he had the word of God. Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Then we get to verse 16, which is our well-known, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Verse 17 ends with those two words, good works. So good works do have a role to play in our Christian life, but they come at the end of our passage. But notice, Excuse me, notice where it starts. It starts with the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. How? Through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 are worded similar, in that they say, For by grace are ye saved. How? Through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I don't know that there's many verses in Scripture that make it more clear that we are saved by grace through faith and not of works. Verse 10, though, goes on to say we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. See, the Bible pattern is salvation first, then good works. We do good works because we've been saved. We don't do good works to get saved. We don't do good works to stay saved. We don't do good works to add to our salvation in some way. But rather, we are saved by grace through faith, which, by the way, is linked to, directly linked to, the Word of God. I mentioned back in John chapter 3 how twice Jesus tells Nicodemus, ye must be born again, those two words, born again, together, are only found in one other place in all of the Bible, and it's in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, 23, which, tw uh, uh, which tells us that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the Word of God. The Word of God is that incorruptible seed which brings new life into our hearts and into our lives. <clears throat> Timothy knew the Word of God. He had the Word of God. It was through the Word of God in which he accepted Christ as his Savior, and that's where it starts. You see these 15,000 Spanish John and Romans. Now, it's just two books of the Bible, but it's two books specifically uh, geared toward an evangelistic purpose. The idea is to give someone one of these marked editions. That means there are certain verses highlighted in a certain numeric order that a person can go through and read select verses that will tell them exactly what they need to know about their sin and about Christ as Savior and what they need to do to accept Christ as Savior. They're, they're, they're basically put together for an evangelistic purpose because that's where it starts. It starts with salvation. It starts with being born again. But do you realize that that's not all the Word of God was given to us for? 
Now, we would all say that. We all acknowledge that. Well, right, of course. But we don't always live like that. See, sometimes we live as if this was, you know, the instrument which God used for our salvation, that incorruptible seed, the word of God, now we're born again, and great, you know, it served its purpose. Well, the Bible is for so much more than that. The Bible also is what we grow by. And again, that brings us to verses 16 and 17. All scripture given by inspiration of God. Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Notice verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. That word perfect there in verse 17 simply means complete. That phrase, throughly furnished, means to complete or to finish. That the Greek word that underlies that phrase, throughly furnished, is only found one other time in the scriptures, and it's in Acts 21 and verse 5, where the Bible says, and when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. That word accomplished, same word as, as is given to us here as throughly furnished. To complete, to finish, to accomplish in our lives. Not sinless perfection, we don't attain that until our glorification, but all throughout our sanctification, all throughout our growth in the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to the Word of God, we stay in the Word of God, we, by the way, we study the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15, another one of those verses that I'm sure you know, says, study to show thyself, approved unto God. By the way, you know what Timothy was? He was approved. There was a proof of him that others could see. Why? Because from a child, he knew the Holy Scriptures. And not just from a child, he stayed in the Holy Scriptures. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's interesting. I looked up, you can do this obviously online. You can look up other English versions of the Bible. Now I know there's many, many out there. I only looked up about five or six of the more well-known English version and versions. And do you know, it probably won't surprise you, but not a single other one of those English versions had the word study in 2 Timothy 2.15. They either said, do your best or be diligent. Now, okay, do your best, be diligent. Well, that sounds great. And that sounds noble, but do you realize that there is a totally different thought and connotation given with the idea of, well, just do your best, versus the idea of study, study to show yourself approved unto God. Such an important verse. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Well, Stands to reason that if we don't want to be ashamed, we need to study and we need to rightly divide the word of truth. And if we don't, yes, we're still saved, and yes, we're going to be in heaven, and yes, we're going to stand before him, but there may be an element of shame if we don't do our diligence to study the word of God. We need to study the Word of God. We need to be in the Word of God each and every day. So yes, we publish the Word of God. We print it. We publish it. We send it. Why? Because we want people to get saved. But it doesn't just stop there. I mean, praise the Lord for every soul that is saved, but, but it goes on from there. Not adding to salvation, not keeping, staying saved or keeping themselves saved, but it does go on from there as we grow. You know, we talked about the idea of being born again. We talked about the idea of a baby being born, and you're not born a Christian. But the principle is, same, is the same in that your birth, that's a moment in time. You're born one time, and that happens in a specific moment. Uh, most of the time, they'll write not just the date, but the time on the birth certificate. That is a specific moment in time where a person is born. But the growth process, well, that's our whole life, is it not? I mean, from a baby to a child to an adult, that's kind of accelerated growth that's easily seen. But really, we grow throughout our lives. The same is true in our spiritual lives. Our salvation is a moment in time. I want to be very clear about that. and Maybe it sounds like I'm overemphasizing that, but I don't want anyone here to think that I'm saying that, well, we just stay in the Word of God and we can kind of grow into a relationship with Christ. No, we meet Him at the cross at a moment in time, and we're saved at a moment in time. But then the journey begins. 
and then we grow, and then we walk with him, and then we study his word, and we're in his word, and one day, this body will be changed. I'm going to have you turn as we <clears throat> get ready to close here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You don't have to hold your finger in 2 Timothy anymore. 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> The word of God is it's vital for our salvation, our justification. It's vital for our growth, our sanctification. You realize the word of God is also key in our glorification, which is yet a future event. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. And for sake of time, I'm just going to highlight several things here. I won't read the whole passage, but starting in verse 35. Paul writes, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth, it, God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. He goes on and he describes some different Type of types of flesh there, but in verse 42 he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now watch this, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. We saw those two words in another verse, talking about how we must be born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. This body, this natural body, sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. Verse 44 says, It is sown in natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body, there is a spiritual body, and so is it is written. And he goes on and he contrasts the first Adam from the last Adam, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the one is physical, the other being spiritual. Look what he says in verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Remember we mentioned John chapter 3 where Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man be what? Born again, he cannot see what? The kingdom of God. Well, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised. How? Incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. You realize the day is coming, and maybe it is very soon, when this corruptible puts on incorruptible. How does that happen? Can I say this this morning? It's by the word of God. The same word of God, the same seed that was planted that brought new life, the same word of God that causes us to grow in our Christian walk with him, it's that same word of God that is going to transform this natural body into a spiritual body, this corruptible body into an incorruptible body. I think of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which tells us, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a what? A shout. Well, what is that shout? Is it not the word of God going forth with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God? And what's interesting, study the trumpet you'll find in scripture, oftentimes there's a, a voice associated with the trump. In a sense, we're given a threefold reference to the fact that when he appears in the clouds, we're going to hear a shout, a voice, a trump. We're going to hear the word of God. We are going to hear the word of God sound forth, and he's going to call us up to meet him, and we will be, according to 1 Corinthians 15, instantly, in the twinkling of an eye, changed. So in light of all that, look at verse 58. Therefore, in light of all of these wonderful things about the resurrection and our glorification and our transformation and the fact that we were born again and then we grow in Christ and then one day soon we're going to be changed and we're going to see him as he is and we're going to be like him and can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. Look at verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, in light of that truth, what should we be doing? 
Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, three things that I see there. Be steadfast, be unmovable. You know, stand on the Word of God. Stay firm in your conviction to the Word of God. <clears throat> Some of you have been here and just looking around and got a diversity of ages here. Some of you have been saved for decades. And you have stood on this book. Stay with it. Don't give it away now. You know, it's sad when someone who's not a believer rejects the Word of God, but folks, isn't it just as sad when someone who's been a believer for years, even for decades, says, you know what? I'm done. May that not be us. Be steadfast. Be unmovable. Don't be shaken off of this foundation. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. The idea is serve Him and serve Him more. I believe it's in Hebrews where we have the phrase, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. Do you see the day approaching? For us, it's the day of the rapture. I don't know. We tend to see it approaching. Well, if that's the case, we should always abound, and so much the more. Say, well, you know, the, the virus and the restrictions and I, we can't do it like we used to. And Folks, now is not the time to do less. Now is the time to do more. So don't, don't be shakable. Don't be movable. Always abound. Keep going. Do more. Press forward. And then recognize this. Our labor is not in vain. It is not in vain. Say, well, Brother Sandy, this is great, the rapture and everything, and, and I can't wait, but if he comes this afternoon, well, these boxes are just sitting here. Folks, your labor's not in vain. I don't know what God would do with these boxes if the rapture happened today. I really don't know. But our labor is not in vain. It's not in vain. What you do for the Lord has an eternal impact. Because the Bible tells us we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll receive the things done in our, our body, whether good or bad. And by the way, we, we often stop there. But the very next verse says, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord. Yeah, I don't know what your personal view on the judgment seat of Christ is, but folks, it is, it's going to be scary. Why is that? Well, because those eyes of fire are going to look at every one of us. They're going to look at me, and I'm going to know in that, even though I sort of, not sort of, I, I know it's true, but when, I, when he's physically there and those eyes of fire look at me, I am going to know that those eyes saw everything I ever did, everything I ever thought. He knows. We're going to give an account. And uh, our labor's not in vain. Praise the Lord for his word. Aren't you thankful for the word of God? I mean, what would we even be doing here this morning if we didn't have the word of God? Amen. What a blessing to have the word of God.